Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming back uh, here uh, at the Disruption Network Club uh, conference, uh, Data Cities. Um, my name is Tatiana Bazzichelli, and I am the director of the Disruption Network Club, together with uh, Lieke Plucher. Uh, I'm happy now to introduce uh, this panel with uh, very great people close to me. Um, the panel is called Making Cities Smart for Us, Subverting Tracking and Surveillance. And uh, here on my right, we have uh, Eva Bloom Dumonté, River Honer, Andreas Zingerle, and then we will have uh, Linda Croman, uh, that is working together with Andreas, that uh, uh, will be visible on video at the end of our presentations. So I also want to say hello to Linda, that is probably watching us <laughs> on streaming, and to all the people that are also not here uh, in person and are watching uh, online. I also want to remember that we have a chat, so if you are watching online, you are also welcome to interact with us uh, and uh, send your questions that will be then brought to the panel when we have our question and answer session. Uh, so, uh, to connect uh, with the previous panel, I actually uh, like that uh, Jaromil was mentioning the discourse of disruption, uh, because of course uh, this really is the, really at the core of what we do. Uh, and I want to say also in response to that, that uh, when we work on disruption, of course we are not working on disruptive innovation, but in a sense we appropriated the word disruption to try to understand how to disrupt from within uh, systems that are closed. So that is why for a long time at the Disruption Lab we have been working with whistleblowing and also with the idea of hacking systems of control. And I think in a sense this panel also connects to that, not about whistleblowing this time, but about system of control. Uh, because when we speak about uh, data cities uh, and uh, data mining, uh, algorithms, machine learning, this has a lot to do with controlling uh, our private life and our everyday life. So if we are speaking now about the cities of the future, it's also our responsibility to say how we want to build up these cities. And this connects with the discourse of the appropriation of words, and we decide to have in our title, together with Data Cities, the uh, word smart technologies connected to tracking and human rights. Even if we really didn't like this word, we think it's actually a bad word to say smart technology. What does it mean? The same when people use the word AI, that at the end is also related to algorithms, to machi machine learning, and so on. But we decide to use it also because we want to write a different meaning of it and in a sense reappropriate it by also trying to bring a critical perspective to this discussion. So I'm actually happy because this panel will be about this, to bring a critical perspective to the discourse of data mining and control and tracking and surveillance. And uh, also we will have the possibility to deconstruct a bit these definitions. So what smart technology means and in which sense we can connect the discourse of uh, uh, data checking and algorithm uh, to uh, the discourse of surveillance. And at the same time, how can we react to it uh, to find a way to be empowered? Um, so, we start uh, the presentation with Emma Bloom Dumonté, uh, and then we proceed on this uh, line. Uh, so, Eva Bloom Dumonté is a senior researcher working uh, on the intersection of privacy and social economic rights. She has a background in journalism and she explored the impact of data exploitation on marginalized communities and people in vulnerable situations with uh, a feminist lens. Uh, she has been uh, documenting the role of big tech companies on shaping the narrative around smart cities and the consequence uh, uh, on urbanization. So I will leave the word to you and thanks a lot uh, for being with us.
I'm hoping this is going to work the way I want it to work. No, it's not working the way I want it to work. Um, okay, we'll try it like that. Um, so thanks, Tatiana, for the introduction. And um, as Tatiana explained, I'm uh, doing a lot of research on the impact of technology on marginalized groups, uh, or rather people in vulnerable situations. And so when you're in my position and doing that kind of research, it's very easy to be um, demor demoralized about uh, the state of smart cities and the consequence that smart cities can have on people's lives. And so this summer, when we were uh, in confinement and we were all baking uh, banana breads and having existential crisis, I uh, decided to, uh, to do a podcast where I would... Um, I would interview people from uh, the world of urbanizations to hear their perspective on, uh, on smart cities, but also on how technology could po uh, po positively transform our cities. And I was hoping to get a different, different perspective from the one that I'm sort of naturally used to, which is uh, a sort of um, depressing, uh, tech researcher uh, kind, of, uh, kind of angle. But so the first question I had to ask them was, uh, what's a smart city? Uh, and the reason, as Tatiana was mentioning, is that obviously there is an element of like buzzwordiness to, uh, to smart city. And when I initially started uh, my research, I, one of the things that I was six years ago that I, I was mostly sort of um, con being confronted to was just not really knowing uh, how, what do we even meant by that and how do we define it. And, you know, in fact, if you go uh, on the World Bank website, for example, they will give you two different definitions of smart cities. Uh, if you go to the, um, in India, for example, there is the, um, something called a smart city mission, and it was a mission set up by the government to develop 100 smart cities across India. And initially, when they started uh, the project, they said, oh, we should create an independent body uh, that would be like a sort of an index and that would create a standard of, you know, what a smart city is, and this way we'd be able to assess if the city we create are effectively smart or not. And obviously, quickly enough, they realize at the moment you start defining what a smart city is, uh, you have to confront yourself to your failure uh, when the cities you're building are failing to be smart. And so they decided that actually, you know, it was fine to leave the term undefined, to uh, stay very fluid about what smart cities are. And so anyway, to go back to the podcast I was doing, every person I was interviewing was giving me a slightly different definition of what a smart city is. But something that really stuck to me was uh, something that Ellie Cosgrave, who is a professor at UCL uh, and an engineer, said to me. And she said that basically the term emerged around 2008 and people started using it because it was a useful framework for whatever they were trying to express. And basically, we spent the next 10 years trying to define, uh, trying to figure out what we meant uh, by that. And that, you know, that we should just like relax a bit and not worry too much about the fact that this term doesn't really mean anything. And so I kind of agree with that. And so for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to leave you uh, with what I mean uh, and what I will be talking about here. And so I'm referring to projects that are set up by local or national governments to integrate uh, technology and data collection in particular in the city. And the reason I insist on, uh, on the government aspects of, of this is that obviously when we're using City Mapper, for example, we are effectively, you know, using technology in the city, having a piece of technology that's uh, shaping or experience of the city. And, uh, and yet, for good or bad reasons, this is really what people refer to when they, uh, when they talk about smart cities. Yet, I do think um, 
it is important to focus about how the term came about uh, because the way the term came about is actually uh, very much related to what I want to discuss, which is the monopoly that tech companies have been, uh, have had over the, the design of our cities and uh, how technology has become integrated in our city. And the term was invented by those guys, uh, IBM, and I think that's actually a very important thing to bear in mind that the term obviously did not come from society, uh, civil society, but it also did not emerge from government either. It came from, it was a marketing term, obviously, uh, but it was a marketing word that was created by companies uh, that were trying to target uh, governments specifically. They were marketing whatever they were trying to sell uh, to government. And I think this is still something that we are seeing today is, for me, what I find very particularly striking is the lack of transparency there, there, is, uh, there is often around, uh, around smart city. So it's very unclear often, you know, what, are, what deals cities actually have with private companies, what, what is actually happening, what is the goal, uh, for what purpose are they trying to, to buy this technology. And the fact is that and this for me is essentially the problem. The, the problem is that whatever project that they have in mind, that they're developing, is not for people. It's not people-centered uh, project. They are primarily focused on selling their technologies more than trying to see how it's gonna serve uh, people and making sure that they're to serve the needs of people. And the fact is that, for example, you don't see you know, Huawei or IBM, you know, targeting people with advertisement about like, oh, this is our project and you should lobby your government to engage in this project. The fact is that people have been excluded from this conversation that's very much happening behind closed doors between local governments and, um, and companies. So what is essentially um, the vision of, I mean, here I'm talking about IBM, uh, but I think this is a vision that you see um, very much across different companies. This is a graph from um, a couple of years ago, I think six years ago or something, when I started working on this. And I like it because it's sort of very candidly dystopian uh, with a giant eye in the middle. Uh, and essentially, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter if you can't read anything, uh, but the point is that uh, it reflects their vision, which is all about a city that's extremely centralized, uh, where the smart city infrastructure is built across many different sectors, uh, transport, the environment, um, you know, local government services, and the idea is that if essentially you have technology that and data, and data flowing uh, across different sectors, you suddenly have this like wonderfully efficient and wonderfully secure uh, city. And this is um, a, a graph again from IBM that's you know, much more recent, that's from actually I found it a couple of days ago, uh, where you still see this very sort of like centralized uh, circular vision and you see that people are uh, somewhere in the circle as, as a resource along water or transport or energy. Uh, it's not about putting people at the center of their vision, it's very much people are just there to uh, serve their vision of the city. This is what it looks like in practice. Um, so this is from uh, a picture from uh, Brazil, from Rio. Uh, this is a, a control room that uh, was built at the time of uh, the Olympics and when Rio was hosting both the Olympics and, uh, and the World Cup. And so that was supposed to be one of the flagship program of IBM. And because obviously Rio was hosting all those major events and they wanted to make sure the city was going to be as secure and as efficient as could be. Uh, so they reach out to IBM for this. And this is how this vision of like a city that's very much relying on sensors and CCTV cameras everywhere 
and on information being related transferred from like across different sectors uh, was really sort of like built and um, and um, took really took shape. Um, now, for some reason, there was, which is actually very common, we're seeing this more and more, there was an argument between IBM and the city of Rio, and the smart city infrastructure is not actually from IBM. They ended up sort of like ending the contract with IBM and just building their own thing. Uh, but whatever they built was very much based on uh, the model of IBM. So. As I summarize, like their vision of the city is, as I said, centralized and focused on security. Now, why is that? Um, because that's how you sell software and hardware. And this is where I want to stress that it's not just IBM. This is something that, I mean, at the moment in my current research, I'm looking at Huawei and um, what Huawei is doing in, uh, in Spain. And so, we're seeing it, for example, with a suburb of Madrid called Rivas. And essentially what the way it started between uh, Huawei and Rivas was just about providing a more efficient internet and making sure that like, there was better internet access across the city. And next thing you know, they are giving out for free um, equipment to the police. And this is not like nothing terribly, you know, scary, the kind of equipment. They were like giving them mic and like a very sort of like basic hardware. Uh, but for me, that resonated very much with another model I was much more familiar with, uh, which is um, something IBM had developed, which was called the Smarter City Challenge. And what they were doing is that every year they would pick a couple of cities both in the global south and in the global north. And they would arrive there and spend, I think it was about a year, and they would just give them out IBM services for free. So sometimes it was like AI programs, sometimes it was like delivering hardware for them. So, you know, whatever the city needed, they would like provide it for a year. But then what happens after a year? Well, you have all the employees being used and familiarized with those programs. Uh, we are, they start becoming reliant on them. So obviously after a year, you need to update the software, you need to buy more hardware. And so you create these dependencies uh, between tech companies and, uh, and governments and local governments. Now, why do governments uh, fall into this trap? And this is where I'm gonna use a term that Jeremy was using. Uh, in his own presentation, the problem is tech solutionism. Uh, it's this belief that when you're faced with a very complex problem that you don't know how to solve, uh, that some sort of magic technology is gonna come and solve it for you. And the thing is that cities are facing enormously difficult problems. Cities have to deal with questions like, how do you make the city safe for everyone who's walking through the cities? Uh, including women, including trans people, uh, including genderqueer people. How do you make sure that children have access to uh, education, to schools easily? Uh, sometimes in some cities there will be questions of healthcare. How do you make sure that there's housing for people who can't afford to pay rent? Uh, how do you make sure there's a transport system that's going to be uh, allowing billions of people to travel through the city every day? Uh, those are very difficult problems uh, to address. And so when you have companies like Google did uh, in Toronto who arrive and who say, hey, look, we're going to solve all your problem with governance 2.0. Uh, we're going to offer you solutions to this to make sure that you communicate better with citizens, uh, to make sure the city is more efficient and so on. And really all you have to do is just, you know, um, basically relying on this new technology that's not actually even that expensive uh, compared to more um, in-depth infrastructure changes uh, you could do. Well, it's suddenly very tempting uh, to, uh, to fall for that narrative. And to be fair, tech solutionism is an issue that we're seeing not just in cities, not just for local governments. I'm... Um, I'm from the UK where we've been hit uh, very hard by the coronavirus crisis. 
And essentially from the start of the crisis, we were being told that there was a contact tracing app that was gonna be developed. And as soon as the app arrived, we would be out of confinement, uh, that the pandemic would stop spreading, uh, that basically everything would go back to normal the moment we would have this app. Now, long story short, the, the app actually only came out yesterday. Uh, I can tell you already the app is not gonna solve anything for, just for the simple problem that like this app is only available on the most recent phones. So anyway, the number of people who will be able to use this app will be very reduced. The problem is that we know what could have helped the pandemic in the UK. Uh, basically having access to tests would have helped. Uh, making sure that people wear masks, but when, at a time when we didn't have any masks, making sure that like medical staff in hospitals had the most sort of like basic protection equipment, uh, and obviously making sure that we had uh, a healthcare system that was up to speed and prepared to answer to this crisis. But we had none of those things, and it's too hard for the government to go to their people and say, sorry, we fucked you up with like years of austerity measures and cuts to the healthcare system and now we're simply not prepared. We're not prepared to handle this crisis. It's costing us too much. We don't know how to handle this. And um, 41, almost 42,000 people died in the UK because the management of this crisis was an absolute disaster. And honestly, having a minister going on TV every day to explain to you that as soon as this app was gonna arrive, everything will be back in order, was just infuriating. And essentially, the, the, there is something very similar happening with cities, is that cities tend to face deep infrastructure problems. The fact that in most European cities, and I'm not even touching on the rest of the world, um, the subway systems, the transport systems, are not accessible to people in wheelchair is an absolute scandal. Uh, and yet this is not a new problem. Uh, this is a problem that um, goes back hundreds of years. The fact that it's not accessible um, to women who needs like buggies for their babies or, or men for that matter. And uh, the, the city is not accessible for many people, and yet solving those issues would cost a lot of money, um, would be very disruptive in terms of like the construction it requires, and, uh, and would take a lot of time. And when you have election cycles that are happening every five years, there's no politicians that want to bet on doing sort of like deep infrastructure work. So this is also why the tech solutionism is, um, is so appealing, because the idea that you can have a solution that's gonna solve your problem within, uh, within a quick time frame, uh, without causing too much disruption to, uh, to the city, without requiring giant construction projects, is all the more appealing. Now, what are the risks of um, this discourse around smart city? What are the risks of like letting big companies, big tech companies, uh, framing what our cities look like? So, you know, I'm a privacy activist, so I'm gonna have to run you through the reality of what current smart cities are, which is, you know, the creation of a public spaces where privacy is shrinking. Uh, where essentially you become more surveilled in the public space, uh, where your data is constantly collected, often through your phone, where now more and more we're seeing a project of targeted advertisement, where you know, they're telling us that like, yeah, we're collecting your data to make public services better, uh, but really what we're seeing so far, at least in London, is mostly that we are having now having those like very fancy billboards in the city with targeted advertisement uh, for um, people who walk by those billboards. Uh, so yeah, this is a world where anonymity and expectations of privacy are effectively disappearing from the public space. There's another aspect to this is that the moment you connect anything to the internet, you make it vulnerable to attacks. So we are also creating cities that are essentially hackable. Um, 
but I don't want to be a Luddite here, and I don't want to give you the impression that I think that like all technology is bad and that we should uh, we should you know avoid using any form of technologies in our cities. Um, the truth is that smart cities are here already and they are here to stay. And the fact that we are integrating technology in cities and in the public space is normal and uh, it's a good thing. Uh, and actually a lot of those problems have, um, have solutions that you can, uh, you can mitigate. Well, no, without necessarily having a solution, you can mitigate them. You can have regulatory frameworks to, uh, to make it better. You can sit with uh, government officials and discuss data protection with them. Uh, but I think there is a bigger, uh, a bigger issue and a bigger question, which is uh, what cities uh, do we want to live in? And, you know, we have to remember that cities are political spaces, uh, even during lockdown. So it started in ancient Greece uh, and still today, still during at the peak of uh, the coronavirus crisis, uh, people all over the world still took to the street to protest. We saw this in the US with the Black Lives Matter movement. I am um, also using a picture from Israel where even at the peak of the lockdown and the confinement there, people were going to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv to, uh, to protest uh, against uh, the Netanyahu government. Uh, and I think, you know, embracing that we need cities to be smart for everyone uh, is uh, is a deeply political uh, question and effectively when companies build their vision of the city that's very secure and very well allegedly secure definitely not secure for most but uh, and allegedly efficient they are having a very political framework and mindset they are you know it's neoliberal politics but it's definitely very political and I think we shouldn't shy away of, um, of, of having, of being political about how we think about smart cities, how we think about the integration of uh, technologies in our cities. Uh, thinking about how we are going to make our cities smarter and safer for people who are differently abled, um, for uh, women and genderqueer people, is a political question. It's a question of like, Yes, sometimes we'll need technology, sometimes we'll need a nap to make things better. Uh, and in that case, we need to see how we make technology uh, that's actually good and actually serving uh, those people. Uh, but sometimes it will be about deciding that, you know, rather than prioritizing uh, the technology, you want to prioritize uh, the more the infrastructure side of the cities, prioritizing how do we make our, our transports accessible to people in wheelchair, prioritizing uh, creating housing for, uh, for people who cannot afford rent. Uh, those are questions uh, that we need to be addressing and we shouldn't shy away from talking about social justice, from talking about those issues when we're talking about um, about smart cities. So, yes, that's it. Thank you very much, Eva. I think this is a really uh, important introduction for our panel. Uh, because also tell us uh, how it's possible to make uh, cities smart for us. That was also the title of the conversation today. And um, I'm very happy now to introduce uh, River Honer that uh, in a sense uh, uh, is answering with her projects uh, on some of your questions, uh, Eva, because uh, what she does is also really to find concrete solution uh, to make the city better for the citizens. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, River properly and I put my glasses because I realize I'm getting blind with ears. Um, 
So Riven Horner is uh, a web developer at uh, Expedition Grundeinkommen and also an anti-capitalist tech activist. Uh, she is a member of the Anti-Eviction Map Project. Um, is also, uh, she's also a software engineer and uh, uh, works uh, on the discourse of uh, uh, data regarding houses, right, and gentrification. And she will present various projects that she has participating in using geospatial data analysis, and in particular, the avoid control projects. Uh, this uh, project is also very interesting because we'll, we'll be at the focus of the workshop that we will be doing on Sunday. So I know that uh, the workshop is already sold out, was actually very popular. <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm looking forward to your presentation that I think is actually solving also some concrete uh, issues in the cities and is showing us in a way how we can imagine a sort of inversing uh, tracking methods. Uh, that is also why we call this panel the idea of subverting tracking. I think uh, you do with your projects and uh, uh, for me it was a very great discover to meeting you because uh, from this conference uh, we had a really great conversation and uh, I enjoy very much what you do. So please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the nice words. Yeah, so i um, introducing my talk on the subject of critical mapping, which is mostly about uh, citizen activist solutions to these problems as opposed to government or corporate solutions and just ways of making um, geospatial technology outside of those institutions. So to start us off, I'd start by um, kind of like rooting this talk in the place that we're in actually, because um, this is a pretty historic place. So I thought I'd introduce this with a Tonsteiner Scherben song. And uh, that's, I'm gonna read the lyrics. So the George von Rauch House, which is just over there, I do believe, has a bomb making workshop. And the obvious evidence is 10 empty bottles of wine. And 10 empty bottles can become 10 Molotov cocktails, but the people in the Gauch house shouted, you can't get us out, this is our house. So the reason I wanted to start with this is because basically in Berlin there's a long history of the city and the government wanting to keep spaces that are empty, uh, to keep them empty rather than to have them used for social purposes. And it's actually really common that they use this argument of these uh, innocuous objects are a threat to like <laughs> normal society in Germany. When I lived in the Rigastrasse, uh, we had a house project uh, raided and they took actually all of the coal and they said that that coal could be used as weapons against the police because it could be thrown from the balconies. And it absolutely could be thrown from the balconies. However, it's the only source of heating uh, in some of the houses in that region. So I just wanted to uh, say that actually what you're gonna hear in my presentation is much more of a credible threat against a capitalist establishment than 10 empty bottles of wine. So a little bit about me, I dropped out of university at San Francisco State where I studied urban planning. Um, I learned to code by contributing to activist tech projects. I'm a member of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project which is a hacktivist collective making doing data analysis and visualization against eviction and police brutality and other subjects. And I'm on Twitter at Propaganda Wife. <laughs> I am not uh, married, however. <laughs> so I'll start us off by saying like, what is anti-capitalist tech? That's a question I get a lot when I say that I participate in tech in an anti-capitalist way. And I would start by saying that the interest of capital, as we probably most of us know, is the most powerful interest under capitalism. It's really difficult to basically make anything that doesn't create profit because you're facing the barriers of time, which is really a very valuable resource. Um, and under like the way that the internet is run these days, it's basically impossible to host things in a self-hosted way unless you're working in multidisciplinary teams, like to create a product that can do the kinds of things that can like serve the average person that's accessible to the average person. You have to do so much like work or to get the education to do that is really difficult. Um, but despite all that, we can make tech that can be used to help people like survive capitalism. And uh, 
what I say is anti-capitalist tech is technology uh, that ignores or that it undermines the interests of capital in society. And mapping technology specifically under capitalism is really difficult uh, because digital mapping is a really ad pretty advanced field. Um, it's dominated by these like establishment institutions like government, academic, and corporate. And these industries all profit off upholding capitalism, so they're not going to really provide a credible challenge to this um, economic or government political system. Um, and like the barriers that I said earlier about anti-capitalist technology, you face those in anti-capitalist mapping, except that it's even more difficult than your average web development because uh, mapping and geospatial data analysis, uh, if you know anything about that scene, you might know about Esri, who's like super dominant in that space and they're really a force for evil <laughs> in the world. Um, they, and just alone getting the education to learn this stuff is such a privilege and uh, something that not many people have. So in many of the spaces I work in, there's very rare that somebody isn't, uh, doesn't have a university degree. And I will admit that the time that I spent in university was really important to get for me to learn these skills. And it's also really hard to find mentorship outside of these institutions and outside of, the, inside of these institutions, the mentorship you'll get is really about job attainment and about, um, yeah, it's, it's very rare that like this kind of discourse, that's a critical discourse is actually has space within like mapping communities. Of course, there's some mapping communities like OpenStreetMap that like is uh, where this is very valid. They're also really big in the CCC, but in the average mapping scene, I think it's not such a critical space. It's often used in like geo, um, I don't know how to call it because I'm not in that world, but like trying to find oil, for example. So moving on to the kind of main topic, what's critical mapping? So critical mapping is generally visualizing data, geospatial data specifically, to address social issues. It's often using open or crowdsourced data and some of the different uses of critical mapping are supporting political campaigns, showing people resources they can use, and showing things to avoid. And I have some examples of each one and projects that I worked on. So the first project I'd introduce to you is called Refuge Restrooms. And this is um, a web application that helps you find gender neutral, accessible, and single stall toilets. Uh, I started on this project, we, we created this project at a hackathon, I think it was called Trans Hack in the Mozilla headquarters in like 2013. And at the time, there had just been these laws passed in the USA where um, Republican lawmakers had made it illegal for transgender people to use the bathroom of the gender they identify as, which was leading to like criminalization and violence by police officers that people were, I mean, it still happens, but people were looking under stalls, calling the cops on people for using the bathroom. And of course, like butch lesbian women were getting caught up in this um, like transphobic nightmare as well. So that was what sparked our interest in this project. And just an example, like we have tons of, um, of toilets that made it into the system. And it was a bit uh, weird to be really obsessed with toilets for like a few weeks, but in the end, it was worth it because this is a huge international resource that used a formerly open data set that we then started um, crowdsourcing on top of that. If you see on top, it says submit a new restroom. And we started crowdsourcing data. And of course, like most things I do, there's a map element. So uh, yeah, you can type where you are and then uh, find basically a gender neutral bathroom near you. Also, it's... Um, yeah, there's accessible and uh, single stall bathrooms too. So I encourage everybody to use it. It's still online. Maybe not the most modern web design, but it works. Um, another project that I'd like to talk about is called Light Path or Bright Path, depending on who you ask. Naming things is a nightmare. Uh, this is an application that finds the shortest walking route between two points that prioritizes the brightest lit path. Oh. I'm sorry, I would briefly say about this project that this project has no intention of being monetized in any way, even though it's something that we could do. We like hosted ourselves and this is why it's something that we wanted to provide that doesn't participate in the normal like tech capitalist establishment, even though it came out of the San Francisco uh, tech scene. So this project was kind of inspired by these kind of tweets that we were seeing that were saying like, 
I just want a bright path to walk down. I'm scared. And this person's like identifying themselves as queer. So we felt like it was also a queer issue. And this was a project that I pitched on a hackathon um, in London. And this is just like um, the demo that we created for the event. And what it does is it, uh, we built a like completely custom routing algorithm, uh, which was cool. I learned something about graph data structures. And one thing that we talked about when we presented this was that like there are safe neighborhood apps existing. And um, those are actually really getting a lot of VC funding because like they'll give money to anybody with a shitty idea, to be honest. But <laughs> not me with a good idea, though, for some reason, <laughs> maybe because I don't respect them. But uh, yeah, <laughs> so basically the thing about those safe neighborhood apps, though, is that they really like use this racially biased data often about policing. And if we know like predictive policing and uh, police behavior, they're targeting areas that are already like disproportionately or uh, they don't have like ethnic, uh, they're disproportionately people of color in the neighborhoods that are being targeted by police, right? So it's not really, <laughs> it's like per perpetuating this stereotype that like neighborhoods uh, that are mostly people of color are going to be less safe. Uh, we thought that light, although there may be a racial bias in what neighborhoods get better lighting, uh, it's at least not as clear of a bias <laughs> as uh, the safe neighborhood apps. One good thing about like working on this at a hackathon is that we were appropriating corporate resources, and that's so useful, like I said, working in multidisciplinary teams. So we could, I could work with designers and other people who are really interested in working on these projects. They just don't know like how to get involved. So to be a person who goes into these spaces and is saying, let's actually make something that's not meant to create profit for venture capital. Let's work on something that's meant to like make queer people safer. Um, like people are drawn to that. It's always the coolest people at the hackathon too. And of course our project won because it's objectively awesome. Um, so a more recent project that I've been working on is this, oh God, COVID-16, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that's, imp okay, maybe. <laughs> Okay, that's Another embarrassing. Virus introduced. Yeah, it's like three COVIDs ago. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. The COVID-19 Emergency Tenant Protections Map, which I'm working on with the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project in, um, in a team of about maybe six or so people. Um, I'll show you some examples. So I, let's see, can you read the key? Uh, a little bit. So I'll just say that this map was created to show um, and like collect data about the different emergency tenants protection laws that were passed around the due to the COVID-19 crisis. And as, pardon me, as things evolve, um, as the situation evolves, we want to continue to track tenants protection laws around the world. And um, this is interesting because our team isn't just web developers who make web applications. It's also data scientists who then can correlate these um, different types of laws, and they have many different metrics to go with it. They can correlate that with different global events in order to make a case. And we share this data that's also crowdsourced data. There's a form that you can fill in. And we share that data with um, journalists, and they're making visualizations. So these projects are really important for this data-driven propaganda that I mentioned, because then we can um, different with the amount of data we have, we can make like support policy arguments in different places. Um, another thing that this program does, as you can see, there's a layer selector. Can you? Yeah, you can see it up there, sorry. And uh, one of the layers we have there is called the housing justice action layer. And you can see on the map here that the housing justice actions we have um, are yeah, we have different types of housing justice actions, which is kind of our catch-all word for rent strikes or community organization or a handful of other things. And people are posting those, and you can actually find connections in your city. They're posting resources maybe to their Facebook page, their Twitter account. So you can check out like whatever city you're from and see what people are doing in response to the COVID crisis. So moving on to the main event, um, this is a project that I've been working on basically alone called Avoid Control, which is collecting and visualizing data about ticket controller locations on the Berlin S and U-Bahn uh, transit network. 
this project doesn't have a map yet, so it's my only one without mapping, but you can still do geospatial data analysis without a map, of course. So the main components of this project are there's a data set of ticket controller locations over time, there's a Twitter bot that is used to collect this data and feed that data set, and there's a Twitter bot that's posting scheduled analysis of that data. And I'll give you a background into this, this project. So first off, why make this project? Um, I believe public transit should be free. <laughs> and the consequences of having a privatized or for-profit or mm, what is it called? When you're running a government agency like a business, as I believe is what's happening here, that the consequences are like all the inhumanity of capitalism gets put into a system that we all call public, which I just find absolutely disgusting. So for example, people are often assaulted by the ticket controllers and that we have a system of fines that can lead to criminalization and that disproportionately hurts the poor. Like the most vulnerable people in society are the ones who are often getting stuck into this cycle of criminalization and poverty and are spending time in jail due to this. The Berlin government loses money off of the people they jail, but of course it's Germany, so we must keep Ordnung and uh, if, they, if we need to put them in jail so that we don't have rule breakers, that's the, <laughs> that's the way that we're gonna do it, I suppose. So that's why I'd like to help people uh, avoid that cycle. So here's how it works. The first step is that there's a, ticket ac a Twitter account that already existed called Ticketlos Berlin. And it looks like this. Um, the instructions on there are that, oh, they're in the pin tweet, sorry. But the instructions are that you post a tweet that looks basically like this. You tweet at the Twitter account and you write, whatever, there's some controllers at this line, at this station going this way, and this, twi this is a Twitter bot itself, and what it will do is it will retweet those tweets and it will um, boost them to an audience, which is cool, like you're riding the U-Bahn and maybe, well, you're on the U-1, you probably know they're gonna come on anyway, but like, let's, let's say you're on the U-8 and you're, whatever, scrolling Twitter, and you see, oh, there's two controllers on the U-8. Okay, that's useful, but it, I thought it could be more useful. I thought that if we use natural language processing to create structured data, we could basically create this longitudinal data set. So basically we want, or I wanted to um, identify these recurring points in the data that could be used for like, for analysis. And we have the line, these are commonly occurring things. We have the line, we have the station, and we have the direction. The direction's quite important to notice because Cottbusser Tor and Hallisches Tor are two stations, so how do we know which one is going to be the one that we need to identify as the station? So it's quite important to be to able to identify an align in a station to distinguish between where they are and where they're going. So in order to put this, so well I built a, I built a, a very simple homemade natural language processing library that basically can match any of these stations and identify the stations. I also wrote uh, something that identified the um, direction as well. And then I wanted to put that together in something that could create this data set. So I made a Twitter bot that's listening to the posts and when a post comes up, it runs that analysis. It identifies the line, the station, and the direction. And if a station's identified, it gets saved in the database and it creates a GeoJSON object. And maybe you can see in there, I'm, I'll use my mouse, that we identify the direction, the line, the station, another typo, my apologies, and we link it to the ID of that station. Now, we're building basically a big database of all of the points that have been identified so that, and oh, sorry, uh, Oh, I forgot to mention that the time is, of course, included because we know when the tweet was sent. So we basically can build a big database and what I've done with this data so far and something I'd really like to do, I'd like to do a lot more with this data, but what I've done with it so far is to create another Twitter bot. It's a, something I'd love to do. And right now it's making these scheduled posts every couple of hours. And it's telling you right now, it's just focusing on weekdays or weekend days, depending on what day it is. And it will tell you the most controlled stations and the most controlled districts. 
and um, the analysis part of this other than simply summing the number of controls at each station over time is to check we, we have a um, geographic, we have the polygons of every district in Berlin and then we can count how many existed within each station or within each district. So yeah, that's something that I'd really like to do more with because right now it's just posting this um, very simple analysis, but I'd really like it to do um, automated posts that show a map, for example. Heat maps would be really cool with enough data points. Um, it could be possible to do machine learning. Um, there's some very interesting data sources out there. There's, not to blow up anybody's spot, but there's a telegram group that you may know about, but um, they wouldn't let me in because they don't trust me enough yet. We'll, we'll get them there. And um, yeah, I'd like to do more useful analysis there and to continue this project and actually what are some interesting and useful ways of visualizing the data, we're gonna take that, we'll, I'll be taking that to the people on Sunday and we'll be looking at this data set and uh, coming up with ideas together on how to make interesting visualizations from that data. So thank you very much, that's my presentation. <laughs> I have already a lot of questions, but I would say the questions, we go with this later. And now I'm happy to introduce uh, Andrea Zingerl. Uh, actually, with Andreas, we know quite uh, from a long time, uh, from, I would say, the time of uh, uh, the net art era. <laughs> um, so I'm very really happy to have him here. And uh, also, again, I say hello to Linda that is listening to us. And uh, they are both uh, working um, uh, in the Department of Linguistic Literacy, Literary and uh, Aesthetic uh, Studies at the University of Bergen. And uh, both of them are part of a collective since 2010 that works uh, with the issues related of surveillance, tracking, control, smart city, the Internet of Things, cybercrime, online fraud, electronic waste, and machine vision. And uh, specifically, Andreas uh, is an artist and researcher uh, that was uh, researching the discourse of smart cities initiatives uh, in South Korea for the Go Global Research Network grant, uh, the Internet of Other People Things. So I suppose you are going to speak about that. And um, then I will introduce uh, Linda later because uh, we are now planning that you will do your presentation and then we show the video that Linda also prepared to us. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tatiana, for the invita uh, invitation and also for the introduction. Um, as Tatiana mentioned already, I want to talk about our, our latest research project called The Internet of Other People's Things. Um, we started the project in 2017 in South Korea when me and my partner Linda were working there as an assistant professor at the university um, together with academic and journalist uh, Jonathan Woodia. Uh, we started this research project. It focused on the developments uh, of uh, Internet of Things and human-computer interaction in smart city initiatives in South Korea. Uh, we were looking at the corporatization of city governance and different citizen science initiatives uh, in Korean smart cities. <clears throat> we interviewed local city planners uh, and also organized uh, an artistic work lab, like a summer research lab, in uh, the Korea's uh, oldest smart city, Songdo. Besides the creation of several artworks, uh, we also published the open access publication uh, where we collected critical projects, essays, interviews by designers, artists, uh, activists and researchers on IoT surveillance uh, in smart homes and in our future cities. So you can find the link on the Data Cities conference website and also it's uh, up here. 
It's uh, published uh, in cooperation with uh, Servosat, uh, artist-run uh, data center in, in Linz in Austria. <clears throat> so to give a brief um, uh, background information about uh, the Korea's uh, development towards a uh, ubiquitous Korea and a ubiquitous nation. The um, Korean government initiated several projects to promote the use of IT in Korea. And following the high-tech economic growth in the 80s and 90s, the Cyber Korea 21 master plan in 2001 focused on fostering a knowledge-based economy through the quality of life improvements for the general public. Um, followed by the IT839 strategy that was initiated in 2004, governments, industry and policymakers have focused on ICT-based ubiquitous computing environments such as connected homes and uh, ubiquitous cities. They tried to link virtually everything to a nationwide uh, grid through wireless network and RFID technology. The stated goal was to create smart cities and a ubiquitous society that is always connected through the IoT to ensure a more secure, humane and environmentally uh, lifestyle. These plans have been more about the technological design implementation and less or not at all about the organizational policy and management decisions in deploying a ubiquitous city and the likely fundamental changes of social and cultural milieu. <clears throat> in 2006, there was a non-profit organization called uh, Korea UCT Forum formed to foster the UCT profileration project as a Korea's future economic growth strategy. The membership is dominated by the powerful high-tech J-ball industries like Korea Telecom, South Korea Telecom or Samsung Data Systems. Different government agencies, city developers designed to make Korea the world's first ubiquitous nation. Further goals included better communication between the government and the private sector, as well as establishing the uh, ubiquitous Korea as a testbed for world-class domestic and international companies. The forum produced detailed plans for the implementation of RFID and sensor networks, but again, notably completely neglected discussion on possible social issues or cultural problems. Despite the UN Habitat's recommendations to city planners to avoid viewing smart cities as final products, South Korea promotion material presents concepts such as the U City, the U Eco City in a box, describing export of smart cities as a flat pack option to developing countries struggling to find local solutions to the ongoing tensions between environmental sustainability and economic development. This follows Korea's desire to be seen as the world's most connected and smart country. <clears throat> as I already mentioned, we looked at several cities and city initiatives and I'm just pointing out two now. So, I want to start with Sejong City, which is a special autonomous city built as Korea's new administrative center. It represents a controversial idea to redistribute the power, authority and urban development away from the dominance of Seoul metropolitan area, one of the largest in the world with more than 25 million people, more than half of the country's population and half of its businesses. The intention remains to build an alternative center to Seoul with ongoing plans to relocate almost 40 ministries and agencies to the city, as well as building apartments for a population of half a million people by 2030. Seen as another test bed, an IoT-ready city built from scratch with autonomous smart transport to a social credit system called GreenBean providing an ideal platform for future technology. The finalized city is a commodified city 
where everything is taken care of for the idealized and happy citizen. One of the slogans is also, happy people sharing happiness in the best global city where everybody dreams to live. To fight the declining population in South Korea, they advertise the city as the city of children and women with the highest birth rate in Korea of 1.36 children per family, more than double of that of Seoul. Briefly, I want to mention also Songdo uh, as the oldest smart city uh, of Korea, where we also organized uh, a summer research lab. Uh, Songdo is a part of the Incheon Free Economic Zone, and it's very closely connected to the Incheon International Airport. The intention was to create a new hub for the Northeast Asian regional economy to compete with established international financial centers in the region, such as Singapore and Hong Kong. Songdo was designed and built by US developers Gale International. The uh, Incheon Free Economic Zone Agency uh, is a governmental authority, but privately owned and funded. So Gale International owns around 60%, Korea Steel Company, Bosco 30, and Morgan Stanley Real Estate, the uh, rest 10%. It was advertised as the first truly smart city, a car-free world with 40% of green space and dozens of kilometers of cycling routes. Technology is ubiquitous. Korea's opportunity to showcase the smart city in a box uh, concept. But also due to the 2008 financial crisis, many companies never came to Songdo. Uh, even today, walking through the city gives you a Chernobyl-like emptiness. The city is less than a quarter full, with just 70,000 residents. Very odd mixture of a wasteland mingled with random large-scale development and real estate speculations. It's just a photo from the Central Park Mall, where you see that two-thirds of the, the shops are actually empty. Um, another uh, smart technology they have implemented is a pneumatic waste system that sucks the trash like a vacuum, collects it in a central space, efficient, clean, and state-of-the-art recycling, promised to the citizens, trying to ban the loud and smelly trash trucks from the urban landscapes. Such projects are also um, initiated to, to reach certain uh, LEED certified levels, so to be very uh, ecological and um, green. But, also, but just Songdo residents get a key to use these small trash bins. And also here, uh, like many trash bins in Songdo, there were notes on it that said that the bins are not functioning actually. Um, for us as, as vit visitors in these smart cities, it was made impossible to throw away our trash, uh, forcing us to take it with us or throw it next to the trash bin. The residents were already throwing their trash also. So here is the image of um, these trash piles uh, next to the smart trash bins. Uh, we started a photo series also called The Ruins of the Smart City, where we um, documented this uh, not working and dysfunctional um, initi uh, smart initiatives in a way. The trash was still recycled by hand and collected by the garbage cars that were driving around during nighttime. Uh, one interesting aspect was also the garden hacking that we saw uh, done by old Korean grandmas and grandpas. Uh, it flourished between the skyscrapers in Songdo as the building projects were postponed. We visited several of these allotments, uh, learning that the urban farming in those places is actually illegal. However, the ethos of guerrilla gardening in the West differs from the culture of gardening in Korea as it's often done by elderly people. And this older generation still remembers the scarcity between the post-Korean war and the economic boom. They see gardening as a means of survival 
as well as the connection to nature. The general public that uses the urban space as a medium, as a tool to hack power, even if it doesn't bring the power down. But this also looked like, or for, for us, it seemed to be one of the smartest ways of, of using the environment by the citizens to grow local uh, seasonal food in a way. So a lot of these observations uh, of real estate speculations, obsolete smart technology, and citizen strategies to reappropriate the plant environment, we collected in uh, an artistic research in a four-channel video installation that's called The Future Past Still in the Making. Based on recorded material from smart city visits and different marketing material that we uh, collected during the Smart City Expo in Barcelona um, and other um, smart city initiatives. Uh, also, time-lapse satellite images showcasing the vast developments of these greenfield projects, its environmental impact, and using face recognition tools in a search for the ideal citizen, decoding the visual and rhetorical language of smartness. That's one of the screenshots uh, where we, with, throughout this, looking at this PR material, you see that the uh, ideal smart citizen has nothing to hide uh, because a smart citizen is also a surveilled citizen. By becoming a resident of such cities, uh, one consents to the automated gaze. We were curious how various object, facial and emotion detection applications would answer the question, who are these smart citizens? In the smart citizen video, um, we are interpreted by three different facial recognition applications. So the green um, boxes um, show the analysis of image net roulette. Uh, magenta are the results of a face API by Microsoft Azure. And um, the yellow one is from a software called Betaface. Um, the results range from rather neutral computer users to the judgmental foolish woman. Several rather specific professions from head makers to radiologists uh, were detected. Is it the clothing, the position of the person or the surrounding that uh, determines these images? When an Asian woman in white is profiled as a maid or a Middle Eastern man as a rape suspect, one has to critically question the taxonomy of the training data. It exposes the judgments machine vision casts upon us solely based on our appearance, highlighting how biases and values are embedded in machine vision. At the end of the presentation, I also want to show you uh, a mashup trailer of different PR material that we have been collected from Greenfield initiatives. But now I still want to briefly talk about uh, a second project that's called Panopticities. Um, Panopticities is also a four channel video installation and it portrays mega cities through the lenses of unsecured public CCTV and private IP cameras. Tracking software and the integrated web server allow processing and streaming as part of the growing amount of connected devices, also known as the Internet of Things. These small web servers are often insecure by design, meaning that they are not protected by a password or have hard-coded uh, login credentials saved as a plain text. By default, these servers stream unencrypted and on publicly accessible network ports, providing potential risks of being intercepted and allowing unknown third parties unintended access to the feed, but also to the setup functions of the cameras. Some manufacturers use the same um, settings across their entire camera lineup. By default, the network camera is not password protected, or the default username is admin, the password is 12345. 
can be read in the PDFs of the camera manuals. So besides making this full channel video installation, we also made a poster series that you can download from our website where you see the different camera models and their username and passwords. Security cameras are supposed to offer security, not provide surveillance footage for anyone to view. Often camera owners don't realize that their cameras are accessible on the internet with default insecure settings enabling hackers to enslave these cameras into botnets. Malware will use insecure webcams to infect the rest of the network, routers and other devices in the smart home, threatening both the reliability of surveillance cameras and also serving as a transmission vector to attack other devices. Of course, this camera footage can also be used to then train other algorithms um, and yeah, now I still want to show you um, the trailer that uh, we made. And I hope everything. This land was once ocean. The ocean became land, a city in harmony with people. One day. When it's complete, King Abdullah Port. Amaravati. Mazdar City. Sejong. Songdo, a city built entirely from scratch in South Korea. For tomorrow's Saudi Arabia. Global gateway into Africa the most distinctive city in the world. This ambitious project, which will become the tourist center of the world. An investment and a free zone. A self-sufficient city. And sustainable city of tomorrow. Perfect modern, family-friendly environment. The perfect location for new educational institutions. There will be 200 million square meters of accommodation and more than two million workplaces in all activity areas. Together, we are taking another step toward the future. The future is smart. A city that is smart. And the future is here. A land built for new dreams. Our story is only just beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Now we can transition to the presentation by Linda Kronman. Uh, she is working, as I said before, as a PhD candidate at the University of Bergen, and specifically uh, within the project, uh, the machine vision in everyday life. So now she's going to present what she's doing there and also connect to your presentation. Hi, my name is Linda Kronman. And besides working as a part of Kairos with Andreas, I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Bergen. I work in a project called Machine Vision in Everyday Life. And my focus in the project is how machine vision is represented in digital art. In my research, I analyzed surveillance art and related machine vision technologies using feminist and post-human theory. I will take this opportunity to shortly present how our research into smart cities in Korea, my research in the machine vision project and our latest artwork, Suspicious Behavior, are linked to each other. Surveillance is a big part of the smart city industries. This became evident for us at big industry fairs like the Smart City World Expo Congress when we visited them. And during our research in Korea, when we were visiting a number of smart city showrooms, for example, the control room in Songdo and the Busan Smart Echo Delta City, these showrooms promote citywide intelligence surveillance to be the solution for safety and crisis management, 
They are imagined to serve a common good and to be beneficial for the universal smart citizen. However, research shows that AI is biased and intersections of race, gender and other identities and attributes shapes people's experience with AI. Discrimination is most often experienced by those who already belong to systematically marginalized populations. Several artists are examining bias in intelligent machine vision technologies. In my research, I focused on how bias and normative values propagate through machine learning datasets. Our work was inspired by approaches to examining training sets, such as Joe Bolanvini's work that is dedicated to demonstrate how AI is intersectionally biased, Kate Crawford and Trevor Paglen's media archaeological approach to excavate training sets in their exhibition Training Humans, and Adam Harvey's and Jules Laplace Megapixels project that is investigating the ethics and organ, origins of images used for facial recognition. These works mainly focus on exposing bias and ethical challenges regarding to fa facial recognition. With Andreas, we were wondering what could be revealed if similar approaches were employed to examine action detection datasets. So in this context, we started to develop our latest artwork, Suspicious Behavior. In a fictitious scenario, the user is given the role of an uh, image annotator. The task is to label videos for training smart cameras to detect suspicious behavior. After an introduction to the job, the trainee is asked to start annotating videos. These videos are from open training and benchmark datasets for action detection. The time to decide whether a seed is suspicious or not is limited to 10 seconds, and the trainee is challenged to rely on intuition rather than reflection. What is considered suspicious is in one cultural context might be normal in another. And also developers of these technologies admit that it's challenging to match specific actions to suspicious behavior. Nevertheless, the surveillance industry is developing smart cameras to detect abnormal behavior. Gradually, the trainee is provided with guidelines what to look for. Lonely objects, waiting at a corner, repeatedly looking back, or lingering are just some of the actions defined as suspicious by various authorities. How suspicious behavior is to be detected is strongly linked to prevention of terror attacks. However, the tutorial reveals how complex human behavior is reduced into banal categories of animals and normal behavior. Further along the tutorial, it becomes clear that the unpaid click worker needs to train both on speed and accuracy. For this, the trainee can turn to the advanced training models. Here, the trainee gets to explore specific training sets and discovers that action datasets are either weird scenarios in which amateur actors perform overemphasized movements, or real-life scenarios collected without consent, scraped from videos on YouTube and LiveLeak. The assembling of action datasets face similar ethical challenges as facial recognition datasets when individuals are included into openly available datasets, whether they want it or not. Suspicious behavior is an outcome of our inquiry into data practices of assembling action detection datasets. In this short time, I hope I made you curious enough to try it out. As the work brings forth inequalities in the pipeline of building machine vision systems and raises questions of, of how bias is encoded into smart surveillance cameras through decisions of categorizing and classifying training data. Thank you. So thanks also to Linda for the presentation. Now. Uh, I would like to structure the conversation asking a question to each of you and then I think we can also open to the public directly because we are a bit uh, late with time. 
And uh, so I would say that uh, from the presentation that we just uh, saw, uh, also of Andreas, uh, uh, I'm getting quite worried of what the, the cities of the future might look like. That was also the question of our opening uh, of this conference. Uh, and I think uh, I would like also to focus uh, uh, now in this conversation, uh, what is that we can discuss or can be done also to change this trajectory that will bring us to cities of the future that also, as you say, are not completely done for the people, they are even empty and the people cannot use the facilities that are built up with them, for them. So I would like to start with Eva. And uh, I really like uh, that in your perspective, you said, first of all, that what uh, the cities of the future should do is also to reflect on the human interactions and uh, first of all to speak about the power imbalances that are part of building up uh, our uh, environment but not only in the future, also in the present. And you were also mentioning that uh, uh, as part of these uh, power asymmetries, we have to consider the gender inequality and also the perspective from people that have differently able bodies. I wanted to ask you if you could bring some concrete example that uh, actually were going into that direction and trying to solve these power asymmetries by also doing something concretely for the people. The microphone? Yeah. <laughs> I think my answer is going to be disappointing because I, I can't really point to like one specific place where I would be able to say, I would, you know, th this is the, the way to do it. But I think there are definitely interesting projects uh, that are, you know, basing themselves on this idea of like, how do we make uh, cities relevant for people? Because at the end of the day, cities are, what cities are made of is, uh, is human interaction. I think Jane Jacobs is someone who's really great to hear on this when she talks about the vibrancy, uh, because the essence of city is the human interaction. When you push the smart city project all the way to this kind of cities you're describing is that essentially people have been left out so much that those cities just end up being empty. And I think one way on, um, on the question of gender, one way to, to, to do it is, uh, I was quite interested by this project by UN Habitat on doing like the safe city assessment where uh, in, it was done in different places where it was started, I believe in Toronto actually initially, but essentially you walk through the cities with groups of women and you get them to talk about how they feel, how they um, experience the city. Uh, and this is where you can sort of like draw a conclusion, like, yeah, having proper lighting in the city is something that's super important for a lot of people who may uh, feel unsafe. Uh, usually the fact that people are gonna walk through the streets uh, is and that there are actually people in the streets is usually a major factor. But so you start doing this data collection in a way which is not the data collection about like, you know, vacuuming data from one's phone, but actually having a conversation with people who love you trying to improve and really understanding what makes the city better for them. And one sort of like quick example I will end this on is that I remember hearing an interview with like a French comedian where she's talking about her childhood and her experience of her childhood. And she said, oh, I lived in an area that was very safe because uh, there was a lot of sex work going on. And I went, what? And for her, the fact that there were sex workers in the streets, just as a little girl, made the streets a very safe place. Because as long as actually there were women who were essentially just standing there in the streets uh, all day long and at nights as well, uh, men, there was never going to be anyone bothering her uh, growing up. And, uh, and it's sort of like that kind of the unlikely example that you, know, you don't think of unless you actually start having conversation uh, with people about what makes the city safe for them. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, also this discourse of the human interactions uh, works uh, pretty well for the work that uh, River is doing. 
And uh, I wanted to ask you something specifically about the work uh, you do uh, in the project Avoid Control. Uh, we were uh, speaking a lot about that together. Um, and what I found interesting, and I think perhaps would be important that you point out, is not just that this project uh, is an easy way to not buy the bus ticket, uh, but it's something that uh, uh, more rooted to the discourse of trying to understand how to make a life uh, for people better uh, in the city environment, and especially also trying to solve these uh, systemic power asymmetries that are related to people that are not part of the social safety system or, or the transgender communities that are also harassed in the public uh, transportation. So I would like uh, if you could explain a bit more this kind of motivation from your work and also uh, specifically uh, you were saying that it is important to build up a technology that is not representing the interest of the corporation, but the interest of the people. And uh, in our discussion, you were telling me that uh, it's very difficult uh, uh, to apply this in the production of geospatial data. So maybe you can also tell us a bit more in which way you work with this technology and this, uh, with the idea of mapping geospatial data to solve this kind of power asymmetries. Sure, yeah. Um, on the first point, I think that what a big part of my motivation came from was seeing people actually being assaulted by ticket controllers on the Ubon network. Actually, maybe I'd ask, um, would, you, would people be interested to raise their hands if they've ever seen like physical um, contact from a ticket controller? Yeah, it's like almost everybody. And it's, uh, and I think, probably people would agree with me that it's like disproportionately people who don't fit like, they don't look like they're uh, upper middle class people usually getting attacked by the controllers. Like I've witnessed um, racist discrimination by the controllers, um, transphobic discrimination, and the problem is that they have the power, although they're not directly police officers, they have the power of the state behind them in the sense that if they call the cops on us, the cops are much more likely to believe them than we are. So there's like this systemic power imbalance in that way. And the police, as we know, are not uh, the most sensitive people in our society. In fact, they are also uh, like <laughs> uh, typically um, assholes, I would go as far as to say. So. Yeah, that was a big motivation for me, is that just to have people avoid these people who are often on a power trip in their work. Actually, um, at the project that I'm, uh, this is, so, so it's not just about uh, my experience, it's about the experiences of like all the people who face issues, but um, like many people, like we we all have possibly had experiences with them, but I'd like to share one, because when I was purchasing um, a wall map like, you know, the big map of the whole transit network. Um, I was buying that so that we could draw on it on Sundays so we can actually create visualizations. And I'd taken the train to Alexanderplatz, I bought my ticket, I used the, um, the app, and this is probably super important information. Did you guys know that if you, you, if you buy a ticket with the app and you purchase it with your card, uh, you have to wait two minutes to board the train and it's not valid? So I didn't know that. There's no notice that says you can't board the train. It's just in red, purchased one minute ago. But OK, it's red. I board the train. Um, yeah, the ticket controllers came on. And I hadn't had my ticket for long enough. And um, I was like really wishing I'd just fumbled with my phone for one more minute, like I often do, actually, to give other people a chance to hopefully get away while I'm distracting the person. But yeah, I got um, slapped with the ticket. Thankfully, I actually there's another, sorry to just go off on the, about the beef buggy, but there's another deal on right now that if you buy a ticket, it's valid until three. So I thought that was a glitch in the system, so I bought another ticket. So I had a valid ticket actually the whole time. But um, so thankfully it's only seven euros, but you know, you see the point is like this, um, you know, the, the way that I was treated also when I didn't have this, like when he thought I didn't have a ticket, like it's such, it's like degrading and uh, in Germany, I think we could afford to spend less on the Autobahn and spend a bit more on the transit network anyway. But um, so, yeah, that's a big part of the motivation is just that people can avoid this situation in an imbalanced environment. And um, 
the second question, sorry, I forgot that one. Was related to the discourse of building up a technology that is able to solve these imbalances and especially you were saying that with the geospatial data mm. it's very difficult in this kind of environment. Because you specifically work on that, uh, yeah. do you have experience of your field that is absolutely not going in that direction? Um, well, I was thinking a lot during the talk about this techno solutionism uh, because sometimes I wonder if I'm falling into that trap myself um, and I don't want to. So I don't know what exactly to say other than that. Yeah, like when we have these communities that actually do care to work on this kind of software, like if you find this interesting, I would encourage more people to get involved basically because it's like a challenge of, when we have new members join our organizations, it's a challenge of like um, training people up and yeah, I would just say that it's really difficult actually and we, and there's not money in it. Sometimes I consider myself like um, a non-funded academic in the kind of stuff that I do, but nobody really supports it. Um, some of the projects I work with get some support, but it's not really on the same level. So um, yeah, I, that's a bit of a sad answer, but it's, it's just hard, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Then I have a question for Andreas, um, and especially related to your project in uh, South Korea. Uh, I would like also to go back to the initial uh, point that we were making today related to the tracking apps because uh, during the pandemic uh, South Korea was also considered one of the countries that apparently uh, solved the uh, discourse of uh, the tracking app uh, in a good way they say but this is actually because they were really controlling and tracing the people uh, almost like a mass surveillance uh, mechanism um, so, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, in my perspective, uh, you know, many justify this situation by saying that so this is important to do because uh, we need to uh, also protect uh, the vulnerable people, but I wonder if you could comment uh, on this point, having also experience uh, in the country, specifically related to the discourse, if instead is a better way to build up that, uh, something that is respecting our right to pri privacy. And uh, I imagine if we are speaking about the cities of the future and then if we follow this direction and we end up in what you also show to us, I'm not sure that uh, this idea of uh, using the cities as a form of controlling us even more is where we should go. So, uh, maybe you want to comment on that, also specifically on the discourse of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, tracking up. Um, <clears throat> well, there are many points, but um, what we could observe in Korea is definitely that it's a, a, a strong cultural um, issue, also that people are very um, techno believers and um, they see every new technology that is rolled out, especially from Korean companies, as, as a, a, a new uh, innovation step um, that they can be part of and that um, they are part of a test group, uh, more or less, uh, and, and it brings them like several steps further again to, to the competing neighboring uh, countries in East, in East Asia. So, uh, in that way, they, are, they, they believe in, in, the, in the innovation, in the uh, economic um, prosperity also that, that comes with it. And also, like South Korea as a nation has uh, very few uh, natural resources. Uh, actually, the, the North would have way more uh, resources to mine and to export. Um, but um, so the South is somehow reliable on this uh, technology innovation and, and exporting. Uh, that's why they want to export their ideas also and the flat pack of the, the smart city in a way. Um, and well, with the COVID pandemic, um, the track and trace uh, was quickly uh, initiated and uh, being sold as the Korean way of how to deal with the situation. Um, 
and yeah, I mean, people are well, were very open to, to use it uh, and to be tracked. Um, I saw in some uh, news um, clips also that uh, tracing teams were um, like asking people also where have you been, they had access to their bank account information, but also they did interviews with people and uh, often people were also lying to them because they didn't want to, to unveil where they have been, that they were actually uh, going out on a party and not working in the office or uh, cheating on their partner and so on. Um, but the tracing team was quite proud that they figured out uh, that they were actually um, lying to them. So, yeah, um, in general, I think it's, it's a very strong cultural issue. Also, just coming here from the airport uh, to the conference location, uh, I saw several people just reminding each other that you should wear a mask and you should have your mask on. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't happen so, so quickly in other countries, I think. Um, yeah. Thank you. And uh, I would say now let's open to the audience uh, if you have any question. Yes, there are already two over there. Uh, please uh, now uh, to mention the mask, remember to wear the mask where you are when you are asking the question because we are sharing the microphone. Um, well, first of all, thank you all of you for the presentations. Um, my, here, my question goes to Andreas. I wanted to know, honestly, what is the, the, the attention that is given to the discussion of energy consumption when talking, when, yeah, and the discussions of, or the planning of the smart cities, what is the real role or place that, where, to, where all this energy where, is gonna come from? And to relate it a little bit to what Eva said about how smart cities are not addressed or, or, or not built with people in mind, of course, all of this um, energy question r demands that people are put in, in the discussion because of course, energy and resource, um, the quest for resources is gonna obviously push people out of land and all the conflicts that we know this, this demand. So my question is, is it really being discussed and how and who is involved in this discussion? Well, um, you often see the argument of being sustainable and energy efficient from the, from the um, public re relation and advertising point of view. So it's always promoted as, you know, using green energy and uh, solar parks are being built and so on um, to, to cover the higher demand of energy that is used. Um, but there is never uh, like, yeah, you just see it also in these PR videos from uh, the, the green energy that is being used. I think there is a lot of greenwashing also going on in the smart city. Um, in, in Korea, you see it with this uh, LEED certifications. Uh, you have it on all the posters that buildings are built in a, an environmentally friendly way. Uh, but when you read a little bit more into it, you see that there are four different layers of these LEED certifications and they just reach the, the lowest uh, one in a way, but it's everywhere very prominently advertised. Um, so, but I think in general the discussion also like how, how, energy, how much energy is being used uh, by, the, by the infrastructure that, that is needed by the internet, uh, how much energy is used uh, by, by AI, uh, like it, it is, it's never a discussion in a way. So I think uh, it's, there is a, a strong need for designers and artists to, to look more into this. Uh, and to make visualizations and, and projects that, that um, deal with these issues also. Um, because, yeah, else it's just overwashed by the greenwashing uh, wave in a way, yeah. You want Thank you. And next question. Yes. Uh, thanks for the presentations. I'm a, I'm a fan of trying to hack any way possible. 
resisting the techno-colonialism, but I wanted to point out that sometimes, uh, you know, thinking in very low-tech resistance terms is, can be much more effective. And um, well, an example I have is that someone here in the Keats in Kreuzberg has designed something called sabotation, um, just very simply made out of a certain material that blocks your mobile devices from cell towers. And it doesn't require trying to, to hack these companies on their high-tech level. It's like looking for something as easy, accessible, and low-tech as possible. Like sometimes you just need a brick to smash a you know, surveillance camera. I say that metaphorically, but um, you know, sometimes another example is that um, with here in Kreuzberg, the way the community resisted the Google campus was looking for where they would be most vulnerable which is in their physical space in the neighborhood, to organize, to attack them on that level, not through technology, but by organizing the community, the people, working with people to rise up and say, fuck off and get out of our neighborhood. We won't accept you. And so it doesn't always require techno-solutionism thinking to go against the techno-solutionism. I just wanted to really point that out, that we can get lost in our means of resistance if we think we're going to outdo them on the tech level. Yes. There's a really good uh, poster in the bathroom of the Liebig 34 on the first floor, and it's uh, a poster I look for all the time, and it's a poster that has like five maybe five cards, like playing cards, and on each one is a different form of resistance, sabotage, organizing, um, whatever, direct action, uh, things like this. And, well, basically there's like five cards that are the ones that you would use all the time, but then there's like sabotage and uh, the bit more radical ones. So I totally agree with you. If anybody, if that poster seems familiar to anybody, please approach me after, because I'm looking for it. And the other thing is there's some forms of resistance that we do discuss at um, Berlin funded or <laughs> events, and there's some forms of resistance that unfortunately we have to be careful about where we discuss them. Let's just say that. So I, I agree with you there. Eva, do you want to add something? No, and I completely agree. And actually, I mean, obviously here we're talking about like method of resistance, but as I was saying, as well as in terms of like ways of rethinking the cities and avenues for rebuilding the cities, I, I completely very much agree on, on the low-tech uh, approach to that. I mean, maybe I can also say something, but I, I believe that uh, one thing doesn't exclude the other, and uh, sometimes it's important to speak about how to solve the problem through data, if we also deal with, uh, you know, algorithmic control and so on, and at the same time also try to do it on the street. I don't think that one thing is, you know, erasing the other. It's also an intersection of perspective that we need to discuss in a critical way. This is my five cents. And the uh, next question. Do you mind if I just yes. want one quick thing to that? Um, I was, I, I think about that question sometimes, or just that point that you raised. And one thing is that different forms of argument get through to different types of people. And so one, f like there's groups of people who, like for me, you can tell me a story and I will be like, yeah, those, like I'm with you, you know? And, and I can, like stories of resistance or stories of struggle are very persuasive to me, but those aren't persuasive to a lot of people. I'm gonna say tech bros are very, they need the data. And so if you want to win them over, you can't like, and maybe it's futile. I, I understand, maybe it's completely futile, but I do think that there's a place for like, the people who, yeah, maybe they won't listen to us anyway, but they say they want the data. And sometimes like, I wanna make that argument with the data because it's the, the only thing that they can understand. Yeah, and I also think that uh, it's important that we find a way to propose an alternative also to the people that then make decision in terms of data. So we need also to act on that kind of 
direct reign, otherwise will be only taken by the people that have more power than us. Uh, are there any other questions? Silence. Then I would ask you to comment on each other because I'm also curious to know what uh, you think about the presentation of the others. Uh, uh, I mean, for example, I think Andreas and River, they both are working in a way that I would say, uh, in my perspective, is not only about hacking, but also art. Uh, did you get inspired? Or what do you think? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, definitely got inspired uh, by the talk and I uh, was already thinking about like what could be uh, other like ways. You said that you did pitch some projects at hackathons. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so what could be other other ways where, where you could develop further some projects in in form of, of a residency or, or a hack lab or, or things like this? So that would be, I think, yeah, great uh, opportunity to get together with other people and, and continue working on, on what you do. Yeah. I also was super inspired. I loved the facetious element of the... Um, the thing where you're deciding if something is suspicious or not. I loved it because it's like sarcastic in a way, or at least I, per I perceived it to be sarcastic in a way. Um, and I sometimes dream of pitching at a hackathon, these two kind of um, sh throwing their own shit in their faces. Um, one of them is a CAPTCHA that does the exact same thing, but it's like for cap CAPTCHAing your neighbors, like dropping in the rubbish at the wrong hours, or like, you know, is this click the boxes that identify this neighbor. And that's basically what you were kind of doing. And I really like that idea. So I would be super interested to like go further with something like that. And then my other facetious city hackathon idea was um, a co-working, co-living space called, what's it called? It's called Work Life. Because uh, that's what we're going to have in the future. And uh, instead of having a cool tappable RFC card to let you in the building, you have a cool tappable RFC card that lets you out of the building once you've worked enough. So uh, stuff like that would be fun for me. So like, yeah, I like the sarcastic element or the critical element. But I uh, just want to mention one more time, the suspicious behavior is on is a website actually, like an interactive data annotation tutorial. So. Uh, well, I just want to mention it again. You're welcome to, to try it out. Uh, it's a five to ten minute tutorial uh, with various different uh, endings. So, yeah, quite interesting to click through and see also how fast you actually have to work to reach the minimum wage uh, in several countries. Thank you. And I think maybe we can ask uh, from one question of the chat. If somebody brings the mic to Steph. The microphone, please. Um, we've had a rather quiet session of the chat, but um, I'd be interested to know if, um, do you guys have any intentions of working together in the future on some, since you have so many cross sections uh, between your work? So this is for Andreas and for, uh, I don't River. think we've discussed it. No. <laughs> we've, yeah. No plans. Okay. Although I would take funding. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, uh, do you have something more to add or uh, Eva? Yeah, no, I, I was ju just going to say, um, well, to go back to the initial point I was making, I think it was really interesting to see this uh, uh, cities from Korea because Again, like what people value in cities is the vibrancy, is the social interaction. And even from an environmental perspective, actually building those cities make no sense. Just the idea that people are going to suddenly move is also just so irrational uh, and just a complete failure to understand how cities work. Because the, the cities that people enjoy have been there for centuries. Uh, they are the people that, the cities where people can walk through without needing a car. It's Rome, it's Paris, it's London, it's Berlin, it's San Francisco and New York. Like the, in a sense, the cities that have, that cost the most to live in, or also the cities that have 
these very basic functions. There are cities that you can live in without car, that people can walk through and use the streets. And essentially, this is the basis of what people really value in cities. And, and seeing that kind of like actually basic understanding not being not being understood. It is sort of this dream that people are going to suddenly move to empty places. Uh, seem, it, it's just really interesting to, to see this in... Uh, I also wanted to connect to with that with the question, uh, why do you think many of these cities were empty? Is it because uh, people don't actually want to live there or is just an uh, economical bubble that they promise something that they don't actually realize? Well, in, in Songdo, it's, uh, it, it's, it's due to the financial crisis that people are not, or companies never settled there and it never really took off. And now it gets not advertised anymore to the international um, community and, and uh, big companies, but more to the Korean population in a way. Um, but with other cities, it's more that they are just in the process of being built. Uh, so that's why it also takes, in Sejong, for example, it takes, uh, the plan is for 10, 10 years to move the ministries from Seoul there uh, and with the ministries also the workers and their families move with them. So it's quite a process uh, that, that takes a, a longer time to, to, to move people around the, the, the country in a way. But if you are a dedicated uh, worker for your government, then uh, you're for sure very happy to, to move to the, the happy city of happy people. So, like. <laughs> okay, great. I think that now we are uh, reaching the end of today. Uh, I really want to thank you a lot for this uh, great panel conversation. And uh, I want to conclude just uh, by saying also what is happening tomorrow. But first, uh, let's give an applause to them. Uh, so tomorrow we start uh, at uh, 6.30 again with the keynote uh, World Less Travel, Mega Cities, AI and Critical um, Science Fiction. And uh, we will discuss together with Liam Young, uh, Tony Essenshey, and uh, with Anna Ramskogler Witt as a respondent. Uh, and this will be moderated by Lucia, Co Lucia Conti. Then we have a panel, uh, Citizen for Digital Sovereignty, uh, Shaping Inclusive and Resilient Cities, with Elizabeth Calderon Luning, Raphael Heiber, and Alexandre Monin that is moderated by Lieke Plucher. Uh, so I just uh, uh, say everybody to come back tomorrow and also the people that are uh, following us on the streaming. And I thank you everybody for being today and also our great panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>